on the heels of the 20th anniversary of the Montreal Screwjob at Survivor Series 1997, an event, a moment in time in wrestling history that, regardless of what you think about it, is still one of the most talked about, debated, and discussed events in professional wrestling history, I thought it was appropriate to go back and watch one of the greatest documentaries about professional wrestling that I've ever seen, and that was Wrestling With Shadows. Released in 1998, it was an amazing trip down memory lane, and as the years go by, it's even more so. A look back at the year, basically, of 1997 of the WWF, where so many things had changed throughout the course of the year, and honestly, it was a very cutting-edge wrestling documentary for the time. I know Beyond the Mat gets a lot of attention for what it did and the backstory that it gave and just how in-depth the people went talking about their lives inside and outside of the ring. But Wrestling With Shadows did that first. And Wrestling With Shadows back here in 1997, where even though it had already been acknowledged by Vince and others that it was all bullshit, it was all work, the fact of you had Bret Hart um, talking about heel turns, talking about being a babyface, having him talk about contract negotiations, having him talk about so many things about match finishes and that being shown on camera. I mean, this was really groundbreaking type of stuff when it came to professional wrestling at this time in the history of professional wrestling. It really was, and I don't think it gets enough credit for just how much it represents in terms of really peeling back the curtain of kayfabe and really giving you a little more insight, not as much as we do now, obviously, but for that time 20 years ago, it was significant. It was vastly different than what we were used to in terms of the presentation of professional wrestling. Uh, it gave you a great look again back at the year of 1997, and it was really interesting uh, living it through the eyes of arguably the top guy in the company at the time, Brett the Hitman Hart, and kind of the life of a top wrestler, a top superstar in a major wrestling company like that, and the different challenges in terms of life on the road, time away from family, uh, worrying about character and how character is perceived, worrying about whether your heat's going to get killed off because it's going to translate to somebody else, worrying about is this the right finish, how are we going to do this finish, um, contract negotiations, should I stay with this company that I've been with for over a decade? Does the loyalty mean something? Does the money mean something? Then later on, does the money mean something? I mean, we're just incredible, just absolutely incredible. It's also kind of sad to go back and look too, especially as you're looking through the eyes of Bret Hart and you see on camera guys like Davey Boy Smith, gone. You see Owen Hart, gone. Brian Pillman, gone. So many of these guys, gone. And you realize that this was 20 years ago, but it really honestly feels like a lifetime ago. And when you look at the WWE and the professional wrestling landscape today, compared to what it was back then, it does feel like a lifetime ago. It's not even an indictment necessarily a positive or negative towards today's business. It's just entirely, entirely different. Uh, some of the other things I thought were fascinating about this documentary you got a lot of insight into the Hart family, some insight into Brett's background with professional wrestling, how he got into the business, how he came to be in the WWF. You got a little bit on Stu Hart and the dungeon, and it's funny seeing a guy in his 80s stretching out young athletic men in the basement of the house, hearing him scream and moan and cry. I mean, this was funny stuff. Reliving the whole movement of Bret Hart going from hero to being a villain, but being a heel in the U.S., but a hero in Canada. Reliving all of that Team Canada stuff from 1997. And for those of you that have watched me for any extended period of time, you know I've never been big on the Hitman. As Austin once said, you put an S in front of Hitman, you got my exact opinion on Bret the Hitman Hart. Well, sometimes I've kind of agreed with that, for sure. But 1997 was not one of those periods where I agreed with that. I still think it's Brett's best work 
in professional wrestling. I thought he did his best promo work during this time. Frankly, I thought he did his best character work as this time. He had some of his best matches during this year of 1997. That's for damn sure. All I have to say is Austin versus Brett's submission match at 13. Need I say much more, but you've got him and Taker at SummerSlam. And then, of course, Survivor Series and the legendary match that that became, you know, especially with the finish. Um, but seeing the whole arc of Bret Hart's last year in WWF and how you kind of kick it off with him trying to decide at the beginning, uh, tail end of 96, you know, is where it really started and trying to figure out, am I going to stay with WWF? Am I going to go to WCW? Or am I going to stay where this company has been really good to me for a number of years and I'm a top guy and I make a decent amount of money? Um, where they're giving me the opportunity to have this 20-year contract, which will carry me throughout the rest of my wrestling career and into an office role post-retirement? Or do I go and chase the money of WCW, who was leading the ratings war at the time that had all types of momentum? Hogan was there. Savage was there. Hall and Nash were there. All these top guys were there. You still had Flair and Sting and Luger and so many other guys. And they're offering you about $3 million a year. And it's fascinating when you go back and look at 1997, the fact that Bret Hart was talking about specifics of money in a documentary where even now to this day a lot of guys are still uncomfortable talking about payoffs and how much they make and how much they were offered. You know, not everybody's a Kevin Nash or a Scott Hall talking about sting money or greater than sting money and so on and so forth. Not everybody's like that. But to hear this 20 years ago, where Brett's openly talking about contract negotiations, talking about how much he was offered here and how much he was offered there. It's fascinating stuff to this day, let alone in 1997. Again, this was earth-shattering stuff. This is the type of crap you would hear as speculation on the dirt sheets at that time, and Brett's just out here spilling it to you on Wrestling With Shadows. And then you see the decision that Brett makes to ultimately stay with the WWF and sign that 20-year deal. And then as we go through and you get to... Uh, 97 and you get to his program with Austin and you could even hear it in the documentary there whereas Brett and Austin have kind of acknowledged that Brett saw Austin coming before Austin and Vince and everybody else saw Austin coming it really is validated on this documentary based off of the way uh, Brett's talking about it and the way he was kind of getting while he wasn't always in agreement with where the product was going and he didn't like the direction this product went especially in the second half of 97 and how much more sexuality and vulgarity there was in the product and the characters specifically referencing Shawn Michaels and DX but the other sexual stuff too but he could see that we were getting into that weird place of professional wrestling where it was about the anti-hero where the bad guys were so bad that they became the coolest dudes and the baddest asses on the block. See Stone Cold Steve Austin. And he was recognizing that the company was starting to figure it out and recognizing that, hey, the fans are telling us, imagine that, the fans telling you what to do and listening to them, but they were starting to figure it out. The fans were saying, this is the guy, this is the guy, this is the guy, and it's not a bread, it's not this guy, it's not that guy, it's Austin. And honestly... It was interesting to hear Brett as he kind of talked about it, and you know you could see that he understood. He might not have personally loved it, but he understood it and he got it. And ultimately, you get that insight into the match at WrestleMania 13 and talk him talking about the double switch, which is the design, and it was executed perfectly. It's why it's one of those great legendary, not just WrestleMania matches, but wrestling matches of all time, because it allowed the WWE to do all these great and interesting different things with Bret Hart and Team Canada throughout 1997. I mean, really, even in the late 90s, you were still able to do this nationalistic U.S. versus Canada thing, and it was incredible. But then at the same time, you're launching Austin off on his own direction, on this different new direction that Really, the WWF had never really truly went down that path before. Maybe the closest you got was superstar Billy Graham in the 70s, but you were still embracing him as a heel in that title run. He was still being packaged and presented as a heel. Austin now was going from being the ultimate finger-flipping bad guy to being the finger-flipping top hero for everybody, the anti-hero. Great to watch that stuff. And, you know, some of the talk again about how the how the matches were being put together and how to do the finishes and how those things get pieced together. Again, at this time, to see this being talked about in documentaries was revolutionary. 
And, uh, you know, of course, Vince Russo made sure he snuck in a couple of times, being a mark for himself getting on camera. Just saying, just saying. Uh, but then you see in 97, as the company changes and as the product changes, that Brett's attitude towards the place starts to change. And then Vince eventually tells him that, hey, uh, we, we, it's not sustainable. We can't keep you on this contract. We're doing you a favor Go to WCW and see if they'll give you a better offer. And if they are, we won't stop you from taking it. Which, of course, leads up to the events of what ultimately took place. Brett accepts the contract with WCW, gets his close to $3 million a year, gives his notice to WWF, which at that point in time they're more than happy to give him because they felt like they were going in a different direction and... You know, even though they sold him a line of financial peril, it wasn't necessarily entirely true. It was the fact of they felt like maybe Bret Hart was going to hold him back. Then they didn't want to have that type of long-term commitment on the books, especially as they were looking in the future to go public and so forth. But hearing Bret and how he still, even though he knew that he was going to get a shit ton of money from WCW, and this was a whole new opportunity to go to a place that was reigning supreme in the ratings war, and all of this, that he still felt you could tell some loyalty to Vince and the WWF because without them, he might not have ever had that opportunity to make all that money with WCW. But ultimately, the decision was made. And then it all culminates around what happened at Survivor Series 1997. The lead up to it, you know, where Vince had basically leaked out that uh, Brett was leaving and it was Vince that leaked that out. Make no mistake about it. And... How the crowds were kind of turning on Brett, but they were also sad to see him go, but they were kind of pissed at him and for his selling out and so on. And then we get to Survivor Series itself. And it was weird, the whole thing with Brett wearing a wire as he went in to talk to Vince and talking about finishes and this and that. It was just a fascinating look at this important moment in WWF and wrestling history. If you are a nerd for Survivor Series 97, if you're a geek for the Montreal Screwjob and it's something you still drool over and think about to this day and talk about and debate and discuss to this day, Wrestling With Shadows is a must watch for you because you truly get the behind the scenes to a certain degree that nobody else did. How the day started and how the day ended. It's interesting though of course that the cameras were told to cut off just before Vince got into the locker room so we never saw what happened but we saw his wife at the time Julie confronting Triple H and others talking about you knew how dare you my ass you've got Sean in the locker room saying I swear to God in his phony ass voice I swear to God I didn't know I had no idea I have never signed up for this and knowing he's lying through his ass hairs the entire time um, it was interesting too hearing the fans being interviewed talking about uh, Canada and USA, these dopey people from 20 years ago. My goodness. Um, but see, you know, what happened after the match and seeing the blowback and the reaction and what all went down. Um, the one thing that's kind of tough for me to get over when watching this documentary is hearing Brett, who, whether you like me saying it or not, the fact is he's always been a massive mark for himself. And to a degree, that's okay, but it is what it is. He is a massive mark for himself. And this was presented in such a pro Brett positive light that at times it could be a little overwhelming. It's like, eh, there's another side to this story. Let's stop trying to make you out to be such a hero. The guy legitimately thought he was a hero, and to a certain degree, maybe he was in Canada. But it was an example sometimes of buying into and believing too much of your own bullshit. Now, granted, I understand Wrestling With Shadows was not exactly going to be a hitman hit piece, and you're not exactly going to uh, put your top uh, subject matter, your top babyface in this case, in a negative light, but a little more balance could have been helpful here because sometimes hearing them talk about this and that, it got to be a little, oh, come on, Brett, give me a freaking break. But ultimately, he is what he is. But what this ultimately still is, even in spite of that, is a fascinating look behind the scenes of professional wrestling and a fascinating look behind the scenes specifically at one of the most historically significant moments in time in professional wrestling history. If you've watched it before, with it being the 20th anniversary of Survivor Series 97 and the Screwjob, go watch it again. And if you're young enough where you've never watched this before, it's on YouTube. Go find it. It's an hour and a half. 
it's worth your time, I promise you. It gives you so many fascinating insights and details about the WWF in 1997, Bret Hart's last year in the company. It is a must watch and still to this day for me, one of the best wrestling documentaries I've ever seen.